most 
of the day. I often thought, this must be a nightmare, and somehow if I close my eyes and open them up again, the nightmare will disappear. But the nightmare did not disappear. It was late in the afternoon when our processing began. We were doing a short haircut. Our glasses were returned with a huge oil painted red cross on the back. Then they lined us up for registration in the room. When my turn came, I decided to give them as much trouble as a 10 year old could. <laughs> Four people were straight, two Nazis and two women prisoners, while the heat radiator looked like a long pen with a needle, and the needle was heated over the flame of the red. Then the needle got hot, they dipped it into him, and then they burned into my left eye, dot by dot. The capital letter A dash 7063. Where are we came? Capital A dash 607064. Auschwitz was the only Nazi camp that had to be teammates. My husband is a survivor of four years of Buchenwald. He does not have a tattoo. And when you will have a chance to look at my tattoo, you might think that it has faded. Incorrect. It was always like that. When I compared notes with Miriam, she said that in addition to creating a general confusion, I beat the Nazi all in my heart. I am sure that I was capable of doing that, but I don't remember. After all, I was raised to be a nice girl. As you know, nice girls and nice boys don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so I must have locked it out of my mind. Once in the process, we were taken to our barrack, which was a marginal wooden horse barn, Kelsey and Cruz. The middle of the bed was divided in two, then a walkway, and then the three story high bunkers. Miriam and I were given a bunker on the bottom. We had not stretched out or sweat really in four days. So we thought maybe we could at least grab an air. But human beings cannot function after such a dramatic day. Could I have thought in that term and I could not fall asleep? Unless I was tossing and turning and noticed something big and dark moving on the floor, and I counted them. Then I got to five, I jumped up screaming. Mice! Mice! I was always scared of my coming from afar. A girl from the top of the said, Seriously, these are not ones. We are wet. We better get used to them because they are everywhere. So now we couldn't even try to go back to sleep. We went to the library. And as we entered the library, there on the pencil of the floor, there's a scattered corpse of three children. I had never ever seen anybody there before. But to me it was clear the children died there and that would happen to William and me unless I did something to prevent it from happening. So right then and there I made the silent pledge that I would do anything and everything within my heart to make sure that William and I shall not end up on that closely lateral floor. I never told Miriam about it, and I realized it to him why I didn't. Let's say that I would have said to Miriam, Miriam, I made this big decision. She might have asked me, now, how on earth are you going to do that? I had no idea how to survive Auschwitz, and I didn't want anybody to ask me such questions, but all that was done instinctively. So from the moment we left the lottery, I even had an image in my mind of Miriam and me walking out of the scandal eye. And I never let go of that image until the day we were remembered. We would be awakened every morning at 5 a.m. By 6 a.m. we were outside for a home. Then we would go back to the barrack for Dr. Mengel's daily inspection. And he would count us every morning to go to the house. How many benefits he had that day? Then we would get breakfast, which was nothing more 
for a warm, bitter, lukewarm, broadly sweetened cold coffee. At noon, if we were in the bed, we left the stuff that looked like cream of wheat, except the cream spoon, no cream swallowed. So I'm sure it was not cream of wheat. At night, we would get a two and a half inch, very, very dark bread. But it tasted okay and it filled my own empty stomach. So after three days in Auschwitz, I decided that I was going to save the bread for the next morning because at night I could sleep even though I was very hungry. I want to mention here something that I usually don't talk about. Miriam and I talk very, very little. I never consulted with her, and my understanding is, from the first time that I didn't tell her that I was going to survive, that you couldn't really trust anybody's reaction. And people who are scared to death of their lives turn inward. So there was very, the most that I would communicate with me, ask her, do you have another piece of bread? make sure you don't get sick, because getting sick may die. So, the next morning I woke up, my bread was gone, stolen by those future. So I had a difficult decision to make every night. Should I eat my bread tonight, or should I gamble and have some bread next day? So Nazis could have given us a bread in the morning. They knew how to keep it safe from the rats as they gave the bread to the people who went to work. But we were not even given that little privilege. So after our lukewarm brownie sugar with breakfast, we would be taken for experiments. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we would be placed naked in a room up to eight hours a day. Most of my body parts were measured compared to my twin sister and compared to charts. These experiments were not dangerous, but how would any of you cope if you had to stand or sit naked for eight hours a day in order to live? The only way that I could cope with it was by blocking it out of my mind. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we will be taken to another lab that I call the blood lab because they would tie both of my arms to restrict the blood flow, take a lot of blood from my left arm, and give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm. Those were the dead ones. The content of those injections, we didn't know then, no more, not today. After one of those injections, I became very ill with a very high fever. In fact, I was trying to hide. Because the room were in the camp, and everything we knew about Auschwitz came from two sources. Personal experience or rumor. Nobody welcomed and said, this is what's going to happen to you here. The rumor was that anyone taken to the hospital never came back. So I did not want to be taken to the hospital. My next visit to the blood lab, they didn't tie my arms for blood taking and injection. Instead of that, they measured my fever and I knew I was in trouble. I had a very high fever. Both my arms and legs were swollen and I had huge red spots throughout my body. I was taken to the hospital. The hospital was another barrack filled with people who looked more dead than alive. Next morning, Dr. Mengele came in he never ever examined me. He only looked at the fever chart. And then he declared, laughing sarcastically, he said, too bad. She's so young. She had only two weeks to live. I knew he was right, but I refused to die. So I made his second side of the pledge that I would prove Dr. Mendel wrong. I would survive and be reunited with Mendel. For the following two weeks, I was between life and death. I had only one clear memory, crawling on the back floor because I no longer could walk. And 
I was strong to reach a faucet with water at the other end of the bed, because this bed was nothing but concrete water. And as I was crawling, I would fade in and out of consciousness, and I kept telling myself, I must survive, I must survive. <coughs> After two weeks, my fever broke, and I immediately felt a lot better. It took me another three weeks before the fever chart showed normal, and I was released and reunited with me again. The happiness of our reunion was short-lived. Miriam looked very sick. When I asked her, what on earth have they done to you? She said, I cannot talk about it. I will not talk about it. And we never talked about even the word Auschwitz until 1985. In trying to understand that children who fight for their life cannot go back to the memory until they can trust the world again. Because once we remove trust of a child's life, they cannot trust the world, even as grown-ups. And the second reason I believe that most survivors of the Holocaust, and I'm sure some of you might have known some or even have relatives in your family, even liberators didn't talk about it. They are afraid. And until you feel emotionally strong enough to cope with the memory. And I believe that for people who are afraid that they will fall apart, I have learned from my lectures since 1978 that the memories came slowly and then little by little more and more. So I believe that I only remember as much as I emotionally could cope with. And uh, in 1985, I asked Miriam, when we talked, I said, do you remember that I was taken to the hospital? She said, yes. I said, but well, what happened to you while I was there? Because there are no books written about memory of experiments. There is only one single book written by Dr. Nisri Mangler's pathologist. She said, well, for the first two weeks after you were taken away, I was kept in isolation with Nazi doctors studying me 24 hours a day. They were waiting for something to happen. I do not know what that was, and I don't know if it happened or it didn't happen. That was the same two weeks that Michael said I would die. I told Miriam, it didn't happen. I spoiled the experiment. I survived. The Auschwitz Museum and from Dr. Nisman's book, we have heard that they have used 1,500 sets of twins, mostly children. The estimated number of survivors is 200 children who survived the camp. So most of the victims died. Would I have died? Many of them have been killed immediately with an injection into the heart, and the man would have done the cooperative autopsy. In normal life, you cannot do that. In Auschwitz, everything was possible. So this is the way I believe that most of the two weeks died. I said to her, so what happened to you after the two weeks there? She said, well, I was taken back to the lab, injected with all kinds of injections that made me feel very sick. We did not find out what happened to her on fear. And she after the war, she was only a little bit bigger than I was. But in 1960, she expected her first baby she developed severe kidney infections that did not respond to any antibiotics. Second, pregnancy in 1963, got worse, and this time the Israeli doctor studied her, and they found out that Miriam's kidneys never grew larger than the size of a 10-year-old child. I then did not to have any more children, because every pregnancy was a life crisis, but Miriam had a third child, and after the third child was born, her kidneys started deteriorating, and by 1987, she had to go on dialysis. She was a registered nurse, that's the reason Cora knows her, so they went to school together, and she did not want to go on dialysis. So I had two kidneys, one sister was an easy choice, I donated one of my kidneys, we were a perfect match. 
And at that hospital in Tel Aviv, they have been doing transplants for 10 years, and they have 2,000 survivors. All of them have been on anti-rejection medication. None of them developed cancer spots in the blood, nearly a day. They tried to figure out how they could help her. But they were out for six years. The cancer metastasized everywhere, and they died June 6, 1996. I will take you back to the camp for a few more observations because they are important to me and I think you might want to know. As a 10 year old child in Auschwitz, I thought that the whole world was a big concentration camp, that everybody in the world lived like I did, without parents, in miserable conditions, starving to death, surrounded by Nazi guard there and there. There, that is the way the world was. And nothing really happened on the end of August when one day an airplane appeared over the skies of Auschwitz. It was flying very low. I could see the American flag on one of the wings. That was my first sign of hope that somebody was trying to get us out of the camp, liberate. And let me tell you, hope in Auschwitz was a very short supply. The air rate continued and increased every day. By the end of September, we had two air rates. And I thought to myself, the good guys are winning, the bad guys are losing. And I was right. Suddenly, our experiments dropped from six days a week to five days. By October, we had Three days, the experiments dropped to four days a week, and by the end of November, we had four hours a day. And all the experiments stopped. Now you could sense, I could sense it in every ounce of my being. And this is when we really start to talk among ourselves a lot more. We could feel that this fight in Canada lasts forever, and someday soon we will be free. And we will develop a daily chant of slogan someday soon, we will be free. But we do not know how that will happen. <coughs> what will really happen, besides the happy fighting of here, early January, four or five, when we were told, everybody out of the bags after the evening, we are taking deep <coughs> into Germany to protect it from the fighting. But uh, now that we decided to stay in the direct because among ourselves, we thought that we didn't like the Nazis when they were winning the war. So now that they are losing it, the problem will be even bigger. And who wanted to go out into the cold January weather with the poor clothing that we had? I talked to a survivor a few years ago, who's also a twin, and I said, Why did you go to the desk? She said, Well, they came into the barrack with guns and pointed them at our head. Nobody came into our bed. We had a guardian angel, they skipped our bed. Next morning we woke up, we opened the bed door, and all the guard towers were empty. We were on our own, all the Nazis were up. As I learned years later, from the 150,000 inmates, only 8,500 are made. The grown ups cut the barbed wire so we could organize. And organizing them went to the stealing from the Nazis. But please forgive me, I will never call it stealing. So we are going to go for organizing. We need to be organized. <laughs> Bread, water, and records. One day I was in the kitchen, and the way that happened, I need to explain to you that Miriam, when we on one occasion, we stood for roll call for 12 hours. Miriam's feet broke very badly. I will now, I will just hope that more wiry person, I jumped a lot, moved a lot, and she obviously didn't move enough. And so when I organized something, she always stayed in the bed to watch it, otherwise I couldn't find it when I got there. So I went on organizing myself, and I was in the kitchen with a few other <coughs> inmates from the camp, and we got the same sound of a car. And no one had a car, but the Nazis, we went outside, and we went out 
carry them on an army vehicle like a jeep, pulled out his junk dog, took their machine gun that they began spraying bullets indiscriminately in every direction. The last thing I remember was the barrel of the gun pointed at my head. I faded away. I woke up sometime later and I tried to feel my legs, I could, my arm, I could. So I saw maybe that's the way it is not to walk. But when I looked down, I saw piles of bodies all around me. I reached out and touched one of them and she was ice cold. And this is when I realized that all these people were murdered. According to the Auschwitz record, 200 people were murdered on that occasion, and I was still alive. I raced back to the bed and told Miriam what happened. It was very sad to see people die so close to the liberation. And second, we wondered why did the Nazis come back? That was the good news, but we found out in the middle of the night they blew up the gas chamber, the crematorium, the Canada building, and they were trying to eliminate the evidence. Our bed was on fire, flames were shooting from the roof. We couldn't stand the heat, we walked outside, and the same for Nazis were waiting for us, or there was so much. Anyone who couldn't walk fast enough was shot on the spot. We arrived in the middle of the night of January 18th in Auschwitz 1, and we raced for the two story buildings for safety. The Nazis couldn't take us any further because the Allies were outside the city limits. Heavy fighting was raging between the Allies and the Nazis, and we were smack in the middle. But for the next nine days, my biggest problem in Auschwitz was there was nothing to drink. So one day, in sheer despair, I went to the nearby river, broke the ice, blown a container tied to a string, and when I looked up, across the river bank, I couldn't believe my eyes. There was a little girl my age, dressed in beautiful green clothes, braided hair with ribbons, and was really blew me away to the fact that she was carrying a school bag. That was the first time that I realized that in this big, big, big stuff home, there were children who looked like children and who went to school. Well, she looked at me too. I was dressed in red clothes, swarming with glass. And the only school I was attending was the school of survival. Hmm. A few days later, it was so quiet, we saw. The fighting thought, this must be the day we will deliver. The fact we didn't know how that would happen. It was late in the afternoon. On January 27th, 1945, Saturday at 4.30, a woman ran into the barrack, yelling at the top of her voice, We are free! We are free! That's all wonderful. But I wanted to know how did she know? Maybe she just imagined it. Maybe she had gone crazy. I don't know. I wanted to see some food. So I went downstairs. And I looked to the right, straight forward, to the left. I couldn't see anything. It was snowing heavily. I stood there 30 minutes, and at a distance I could see lots of people. They were all red, the white camouflage coats. They were smiling from ear to ear. And the most important thing to me was that they didn't look like the Nazis. We ran up to them. Miriam was with me. They gave us chocolate, cookies, and hops. And that was my first taste of freedom. For me to realize that Miriam and I were alive, mm -hmm. that we have proud of an unbelievable people, that my little promise to myself, that first night in the library, became very ugly. <coughs> that was an unbelievable experience. It was the Ukrainian unit of the Soviet army that entered Auschwitz. That day, they came into the barracks, they then came into Madam Vodka, I don't know how much, they danced some Russian dances, and I remember 
of standing in a circle and clapping for the next two or three days. And I don't even know how many days, but I would say for two or three days. They surveyed the camp. Then they both two cameras and they killed the liberation camp. The field that we marched in between two rows of barbed wire was a completely staged event. And so was everything in that field. Because they are we were only three for three days, but they didn't even have cameras to film it. I am very grateful that they did that because at least Miriam and I knew how we looked when we were in the camp. Now those of you who will look at my picture of Miriam who look chubby. And I want to explain to you so you will know the secret. We were on our own for almost three weeks. I was a good organizer in organizing bread. <laughs> and when we had bread, we actually had to police each other not to overeat, but we ate a lot. If any of you have been on a diet for nine months, starvation diet, and then you ate, you would feel how your face is swelling up. So that's what you see in the picture. I want to thank you for listening to my story. It's a long story, it's a very short version of it. And the most biggest reason that I keep going throughout the world talking about my survival is that I have learned some very important lessons. Number one, I hope that those of you who heard my story will never question that the whole was happened. And the lesson that I want to share with you are three. Number one lesson. Never ever give up on yourself or on your dreams. And I'm always glad to see that we have some young people here because those of us who are more mature, we have been tested in that area. <laughs> but those of you who are young, I see that many of you have found the good part that growing up is very hard. It's very hard even if you live in the United States. And even if you have loving parents, which is very important, and even if your parents are wealthy enough to buy the latest place, cheese was frozen. Thank you. 
were always picked as the reason and the cause for all the problems in the world. So Hitler was elected because of the Great Depression. And all of us should be always aware that economic problems in the world rise because they are going to become the Jews again. And look around in Europe what happened now. He promised his fellow Germans that he was going to solve the problems, but then he decided it would be much faster and he would have a lot more support if he used scapegoating against the Jews. And many Germans joined. Now, as I look around the world today, there are three other reasons that I think Hitler was successful, but I'm not going to get into that. Prejudice in the world today is rampant, and I will confess to you that I am prejudiced. But I am prejudiced against, and very old-fashioned. I love people to dress to me. When I got to the United States, I don't think that I have seen so many jeans at the synagogue or at the school. People would not wear sweatshirts or t-shirts. They would be dressed suit or jacket. Everybody was dressed up. People go to the museum, they look like they are going to head to the beach. <laughs> the people here, the young people are very, very sloppy. And I tell them, don't wear the low-cut glasses. Because you are showing more than anyone wants to see. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And why would anybody want to collect a bar? Because he can't be on drug addicts. And then he told me, these are very good students. Although I never ever used a drug. I was shocked. And I realized one important thing. Even though I will never write this style. But I have been making an effort to try to get to know the person and judge each person on their merit. And if I am making an effort to judge each person, one person at a time, then maybe I can eliminate prejudice from my life. And if you can try to do the same, we can eliminate prejudice one person at a time. Life is number three. I have forgiven the Nazis, I have forgiven everybody. And if anybody would have asked me 20 years ago today, I would have told you, please find a really good psychiatrist. <laughs> and have you had it then? Because you must be crazy. <laughs> Nothing really happened to change it. And what does it mean to be a good victim? I was a very good victim. I was angry in the world. I hate to just about everybody. As I got older, all which is a big wall. I yelled a lot. And my biggest regret is that I yelled with my children way, way too much. <coughs> Miriam died June 6, 1993. I came home from an open house as a realtor. There was a message on my answering machine from my brother from a family in the evening that Miriam died. I immediately called his wife and I told him that I have never met any member of my family, that I had a desperate need to bury Miriam and say my goodbye to her. And I also wanted to say goodbye to my kidney that she was taking this <laughs>
You go up to that mind walker or Miriam, that was a friend of Mendel, and I think if he was alive in 1992, he might be alive in 1993. I actually watched some films, interviews with him, and he sounded very scary. So I contacted the German television network and told them that they had died, and could they please give me up the notice? telephone number in the memory of Miriam and they did. We contacted Dr. Munch to come to Boston and he said, no, he was not going to come to Boston, but he was going to meet with me at his house in Germany. From the moment I agreed to go to Germany to meet the Nazi doctor, my nightmare stopped. And now I had another boy, kind of like a nightmare, I was going to meet a Nazi doctor. But I remember the about Nazi doctors, I didn't really want to experience again. But I was very, very curious. Two, about two things. Maybe I will finally learn something about our experiments. And curious, why was this Nazi doctor going to meet with me? We arrived at his house. His house is about two hours from Munich. I arrived there with a camera crew and some friends who spoke German, so I had translators. And he treated me immediately with the utmost respect, kindness, and consideration, which kind of blew me away. <laughs> and he didn't know anything about our experience. He said, Mendel will never ever share any detail. He always said that was top secret. But he gave me a good interview for my Boston conference. And I can tell you that those of you who saw the documentary called Forgiving Dr. Mengele, that part is incorrect. I never ever thought about forgiving. That idea never entered my mind. Nor did I see what I would ask you. But I heard myself blurt out, Dr. Mooch. By any chance, do you know anything about the operation of the gas chamber in Auschwitz? And he immediately said to me, this is the nightmare that I live with every single day, and went on describing the operation of the gas chamber. The gas would not come from the shower. The shower room was couched. People would be going inside, they even spread, spread a lot of perfume, so nobody would even suspect and a few hours earlier, people were murdered there. As they packed the showroom, the doors would close hermetically. Dr. Munch was on time, looking through a people. The gas did not come from the shower heads. It came from an opening in the room, a canister of Zyklon B. Zyklon B looks like pellets of white gas. So the Canister was open, the pellets were dropped, they fell to the floor, they operated like dry ice. So the gas was rising from the floor. As people were gasping for their last breath of air, they would try to climb on other people, forming a mountain of intermingled bodies. The strongest people ended up on the top of the pile. When the people at the top of the pile stopped moving, Dr. Moon knew that everybody was dead and he would sign the death certificate. No names, of course, just a number of people. Five hundred and thousand to thousand. I have never heard of the coffee. Never read it in any book, never saw it in any documentary. I immediately told him this was very important information and I wanted him to go with me to Auschwitz. In 1995, signed a document at the ruins of the gas chamber in the company of witnesses. So if I ever met a revisionist who said the whole part didn't happen, I could take that little piece of document and show it in his face. <laughs> By the way, you can find these documents on our website. All you have to do is Google Eva Hall. The first thing will come up, Cameron's Holocaust Museum. You can go to Eva, it will show you forgiveness, it will show you all kinds of characters. There's another very important character we have in Eva Chess that I checked about half an hour about the different ideas 
prejudice, forgiveness, and letters to forgiveness to my parents. So he said, I said to Dr. Munch, or you come with me to Auschwitz and Sarah, that I would love to. So now I get back to the Rahok Indiana, very, very excited. And what I really liked about it, that this was not a Jewish survivor, that this was not a liberation by actually a Nazi. Because the revisions always said that this, the Holocaust was an invention of the Jews. Well, therefore, it was important for me that this was a Nazi doctor who made this. I wanted to send this Nazi doctor. I had no idea how to send the Nazi doctor. I didn't want to tell anybody because I would think that people might think I'm crazy. And therefore, quite discouraged me. And therefore, I didn't share it with anybody. So, first, I didn't know what to do. I went to the local Walmart shop and I went to the same card section. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wanted to realize that this was to me very important to find something meaningful because, in my opinion, we are doing a great service for us documenting the reality. I did not expect to find a card appropriate for a Nazi doctor. <laughs> in thinking, thank you, thank you, thank you. Maybe I would come up with some idea. I read cards for two and a half hours. I didn't learn anything. Two ladies came up to me and said, we can read in cards for a long time. <laughs> I said, yes. But if I didn't know what you're looking for, I said, not really. Then what are we looking for? I said, no, no, thank you very much. I left the culture, but I could not give up my idea of finding the means for gift for this nice doctor. So I went back to my life and said, number one, you never ever give up, you have an idea. And for the next 10 months, while I was cooking, cleaning, doing the laundry, or driving the car, where my mind wanted to busy, I kept asking myself, how do I send this nice doctor? What can I give this nice doctor? Price, if you have a crisis, lots of ideas will pop into your head. <coughs> Ten months later, a simple idea. How about a letter of forgiveness for me to Dr. Munch? I immediately knew that this was a meaning for being consistent to God. But what I discovered for myself was life changing. What I discovered that as a little baby, a victim of almost 50 years, has the power to forgive. No one could give me that power, no one could take it away. It was all mine to use it in any way I could. So I began writing my letter. I didn't really know how to write a letter of forgiveness to a Nazi. It took me another four months. And finally, I learned what I wrote, that it had to me that somebody might read my letter. And the truth <coughs> is that my spelling is in English is atrocious. <laughs> I didn't want to be embarrassed, so I called my former English professor to collect my letter, which came back sometimes. So then she said to me, that's very nice that you are forgiving this Dr. Mooch, but you really need to forgive my mother. You problem is not with Dr. Mooch, it's really with my mother. And she said, when you go home tonight, you are talking to my girl and telling him that you forgive him because what I want you to see how it will make you feel if you can do that. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I tried it. And I said, You son of a gun, no good man, no monster. <laughs> but in spite of it all, I said, Wow, I really have the power to forgive my girl. I have not heard from anybody. So even if I forgive Mendel, I might as well forgive anyone who had ever heard me. So this is the way we arrived in Auschwitz, January 27, 1995. Dr. Munch wrote his children and their daughter. I wrote my daughter and son. Dr. Munch signed his document. I had mine and signed.
times when I needed help, that all the pain I carried around for 50 years was lifted from my shoulder. I was no longer a victim of Auschwitz, nor was I a victim a prisoner of my tragic past. I was free of Auschwitz, and I was free of memory. Forgiveness for anybody who would like to cry has zero, nothing to do with a perpetrator. It is to help every victim heal themselves. I met last year with the whole past scholar from Washington, D.C., who came up to me and gave me a big hug and a kiss. He knew that I would give an artist, so I said to him, so do you accept my forgiveness? Oh, oh, no, 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 Eva. In Jewish tradition, the perpetrator has to attend and ask for forgiveness. I said, that was an interesting idea. So I said to him, Michael, do you think that Mandela, Hitler, or any of Hitler's henchmen would repent and ask for forgiveness? <coughs> no, I don't think so. Okay, so that doesn't really mean if they don't repent the rest for forgiveness, that means that I have to remain a victim for the rest of my life. I actually tell you that this is nonsense. Every victim should have the human right to heal themselves whenever they want. To. We should never wait for anybody to ask for forgiveness. The power should be in the end of the victim and not the perpetrator. And I refuse to ever be a victim again. So I, what I would like you to do to realize, what happens to all victims who are liberated from a situation? They remain victims. They have to find people in other places with genocide or other situations. They provide them with food, shelter, clothing, medical, and legal help. We never ever teach them, plant a little seed in their hearts, that they have the power to kill themselves. I can never do it for them. And personally, I am angry with the United Nations. I have no respect for them. Seven years ago, I was supposed to show my film for giving Dr. Mengele at the United Nations. They approved me. We set up invitations. Some of my friends were coming from all over the United States to New York to see the film there. Nine days before the film was supposed to be shown on January 27, they are calling me. We are canceling the film. Very why is that? Well, we have a couple of survivors who are very upset about it. So my son got very upset and called the director of the program and said, Sir, what do you like about the film? He said, well, I haven't seen the film. You, you mean you approve the film without seeing it, and now you are canceling it without seeing it? Yes. Then my step said they like it. Your step still said they like it. Well, United Nations should be the place that to teach people to heal. And they or somebody's, I, I don't know who it was, but I have a feeling that Mr. Eric is ever in charge of that program that he hoped they would get like it for years. I would say that the United Nations, if they really did their job, they should promote peace, understanding, and healing. Because if we could teach every victim how to heal themselves, we would stop this vicious cycle of perpetrator, victim, and victim, and perpetrator. Children and grandchildren of victims are angry and they seek revenge or get to for the tragedy and the pain of their parents or grandparents against the children of perpetrators. It becomes a vicious cycle that never ends. And also, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could teach some of the victims how to heal themselves? But that is not happening. And I am asking you, every single one of you here, who is troubled, who has problems with somebody who is angry. Try my little simple idea. It is free. It costs no money so everybody can afford. 